coach, I'm not going to put any pressure on you, but I'm going to be in Austin for Thanksgiving. Okay. And you better take care of business like you did right here in Lubbock last year. Okay. Those words from Big 12 Commissioner Brett Yormark surprised Texas Longhorns head football coach Steve Sarkeesian and Big Board Sports. Led by quarterback Ryder Dorn, the O'Connor Panthers are getting ready to face the Johnson Jaguars in week two, and it's also the big game in our big game coverage. The Panthers lost to Brandeis Saturday night, 45-35 at the Dome. To cap off the 2023 KSAT Pigskin Classic, Dorn accounted for 340 yards of total offense and three touchdowns. Now that game could have gone either way, but the Panthers came up just a little bit short. Still, they're feeling pretty good about themselves heading into their game with the Jags. Short turnaround, yeah. uh, coming back, bouncing back from a tough loss. But I think we, we performed well. We showed that we can compete at that high level. And so to come back and play such a good team like Johnson, uh, it's a really good testament of who we are. It was a learning experience. I mean, we played against a really good caliber team, and they're definitely going definitely gonna to be in the playoff contention. So I feel like we fare well, pretty well against them, and it was just it was a really good learning experience for our football team. The biggest thing we're, we're the proudest about is our, our kids never gave up. They, they played their guts out. Both teams did. You know, and and you know, it was it was a battle to the end, and 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 so you know that that in itself being the first game, uh, that's encouraging. O'Connor will face Johnson, ranked number three in 12's top 12, Friday night at seven at Comalander Stadium. It is game week for the Texas Longhorns, who will open up the regular season this Saturday at home with the Rice Owls. But that's sort of taken a back seat because of Big 12 Commissioner Brett Yormark and his recent jab at UT. So the Longhorns will host Texas Tech on Friday, November 24th in Austin. And the Big 12 Commission is apparently hoping for the same outcome as last season when UT lost to Tech 37-34 in September. Here's what Yormark said last week while in Lubbock speaking to the Red Raider Club, followed by Sark's response from earlier today. Candidly, we were able to get Texas and Oklahoma out a year early. That was a big deal for us, and I think all of you, okay? And coach, I'm not going to put any pressure on you, but I'm going to be in Austin for Thanksgiving, okay? And you better take care of business like you did right here in Lubbock last year, okay? Jokingly aside, but, but not. <laughs> You know, I got a letter from the commissioner about sportsmanship the day before that speech. And so I'm trying to figure out, you know, about what are we promoting to our student athletes and then to go say those types of things. So I'm, I'm not guessing he's going to have his Thanksgiving dinner with us the night before that game. Yeah, I think coach is right about that. Texas ranked number 11 in the preseason AP poll is all about embracing the hate, they say, as they enter their final year in the Big 12 before leaving for the SEC. Yeah, that's uh, some interesting comments there <laughs> it by is the commissioner. Indeed. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me, though, because clearly he's not happy with what's going on. But it's not what you say exactly. Yeah, you banquet gotta... in front of cameras on a microphone. No, you should not. Yeah. Well, he did. <laughs> he, did. <laughs> he did. He went there. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Our KSAT Q&A is up next. He is the man that comes up with the plan. He is city manager Eric Walsh, and we are in budget season. And yes, we're going to talk about the budget, but since it was our lead story tonight, I know it's not one of your favorite topics to publicly comment <laughs> on. But uh, first off, city manager Walsh, thank you for joining us. Second mm -hmm. off, what can you tell us about the ongoing discussions with the Spurs about a possible downtown arena? So, um, you know, we've confirmed that over the last six months, there, we've had Mayor and I have had a couple of conversations with the Spurs, um, but nothing to share. I mean, I will tell you that from from our perspective, from my perspective, we've got to figure out what we do long term with the Alamo Dome, um, and um, and look at a potential uh, increase um, to the uh, convention center and uh, Hemisphere Park development, and and those are those are kind of the crux of our focus. Um, but uh, nothing's really happened, and uh, I will tell you, Stephen Meyer, that that that's a that's a much larger public conversation. That that if and when we ever get there, we'll have those conversations with the council out in the open because there's that's a significant uh, topic, and 
something that is of high interest um, for the public and has been for quite some time. Yeah, been a question for a long time. You mentioned a lot of key sites downtown that have, you know, questions surrounding those as well. So we'll be sure yeah. to uh, keep yeah. asking you about it. <laughs> but <laughs> let's new. let's turn now to this huge budget for San Antonio, $3.7 billion. Before we get into a lot of the, the specifics, the highlights, I hope you can help people better understand how this budget is formulated. Is this something that your office really drills down on? How much input comes from council members and also from input you're hearing from people in San Antonio? So it's a little bit of all of it, Myra. We do the council every spring meets as a group and kind of sets priorities. And uh, I take that information and um, that gives me guidance from the, from the entire council standpoint. This year we did something different also. We hired um, a company to do an independent budget survey of the public. Um, and we'd never done that before um, and, and use that with the council priorities. Um, I use that with the staff to develop um, the, the $3.7 billion proposed budget. And um, and now we're in the phase of, of the council reviewing it and the public reviewing it for any potential amendments. So. A lot of council feedback up front. Um, you know, from my perspective, I look at what we need to do as a major employer or um, any strategic plans or professional recommendations that I have, and we're balancing it against the the resources we have available. Um, it's it is it's not just our financial plan for the next year. It's uh, in many cases our operating plan. So. Well, and, and we're in the middle of that right now. Yeah, it, uh, one of the things I want to talk, and obviously there's some town hall meetings uh, that that if people want to give their feedback. But one of the things I want to talk about, especially in the wake of the recent, most recent uh, dog attack, where we're, we're going to report tonight at 10 o'clock that a 70 year old man is going to lose his leg uh, in this last attack. Where are we at with animal care services? And I know there's an increase in the budget. What is your hope that this increase will accomplish? Well, a couple of things. One, um, we have got, and when I say we, the, the community, anybody that owns an animal has got to be a responsible pet owner. You know, many of the strays, majority of the, the roaming strays that we have in this city are owned animals. And so, number two, that, that comes down to enforcement from the city standpoint. Um, the uh, proposed budget next year has pretty healthy increases in our enforcement. And we just have not had the resources to be able to respond to every call in the past. Um, and given the the terrible incident that happened in February, as I started looking at it, we've laid out a three-year plan to get um, our staffing in place to be able to respond to every cruelty, uh, neglect, and aggressive animal call. Right now, we respond to about 44% of those 50,000 calls because we just don't have the resources. And frankly, that's unacceptable from, from my standpoint as city manager, and I think from the councils and the publics. We're also increasing our spay neuter um, services. Um, anything we can do to help curtail the, the um, explosive growth we've seen in, in, uh, in animals um, and providing those resources to folks that may need it. Um, you know, I'm looking at the video shots, all those are owned animals. I mean, many of the times you see them with collars. And so at the end of the day, we're gonna have to um, enforce and hold uh, owners accountable. I want to turn now to the issue of homelessness. That is uh, among the top concerns for San Antonians in a budget survey. We know that the city's laid out some pretty big goals for that in this in next fiscal year, one of them being to take 400 unsheltered people off of the streets. Mm -hmm. So how does the city do that? And are there any metrics that go along with that to say, yes, that was a success. That person is now sheltered for how long, for example? Well, so uh, 12 months ago, I don't think I could have made the 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 uh, proposed the commitment to house 400 people. But based on some previous actions that the city's taken, we now have the ability through low barrier shelter, through two permanent supportive housing um, units that have opened up here in the last couple of months, and with a, 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 a federal grant we recently received. So we've never set a goal for housing the unsheltered uh, last last year's point in time count had uh, had us at 874 and that's just a, a point in time but we set a goal of housing 400 of those folks um in the upcoming year and and frankly the, the metric is 400 we're going to be working actively to to get folks 
the help they may need and get them in a shelter. Um, low barrier is exactly what it sounds like. Very little rules. Um, many of those folks need access to medical care or substance abuse or mental health. And uh, within that low barrier, we'll be able to provide that with our partners. Um, we're also making the commitment that if you call for a uh, an encampment, that uh, within two weeks we'll assess it. We'll do the necessary outreach to get folks to to uh, into our shelters, and then we'll clean it up within two weeks. And we've never we've never set that goal before. This was the number one issue in the budget survey uh, citywide, and so. Um, you know we are uh, we're setting we're setting some pretty high bars for ourselves and and I'm going to monitor it monthly uh, to see where we're at. I think the public expects it, and I know the council does. And so that's that's the goal is to get these people help before you clean out the camp. Yes. I, I, quickly, since we have really time for one more question, I want to talk about the the increase in the police force and the police budget in the uh, in the proposed budget that's out there right now. What was the thinking behind it? Uh, and do you is there a thought that with more officers on the street, crime will go down? Well, you know, we, a couple of things. One, we've been working with UTSA on our hotspot policing, which is just increasing visibility of officers in, in, in areas where we know we have uh, crime, violent crime. Um, two, the, the, the 105 officers we're proposing to add in the budget are a piece of the 360 that we want to add over the next three to five years, really to increase uh, the proactive time that a patrol officer has on their shift. Many shifts right now, officers are running from call to call to call. Uh, with with uh, the addition of 360 officers, we want to give the officers more time to be visible, engage with the public, improve response time. Uh, violent crime is down so far this year. Um, I think part of that is 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 the police. I think part of that is working with UTSA. I think it's also a nationwide trend that violent crime is down. But um, you know, we want to we want to improve the visibility out there. Everybody, no matter what side of town I'm in, everybody wants to see patrol officers patrolling. That visibility factor is a deterrent. City Manager Eric Walsh, thanks for spending some time with us here this evening. Thanks for having me. I know you wanted to take more Spurs questions, but that's all the time we have now. <laughs> we'll save those Eric, for later. Eric, so thank you for your time. <laughs> Appreciate it. All right, take care. We'll be right back. Look outside with live cam. We still got some clouds out there. Hopefully you saw some rain today. Adam. Yeah, you know, a decent amount of our area did get at least some rain. We still have a few downpours out there, especially western side of San Antonio, far west Bear County, and even into Medina County and Uvalde County, some good showers. A closer look at this coming right up. I, I do want to point out that notice how it is starting to dissipate as we lose our daytime heating and the sun's getting ready to set. An update on this, when triple digits return, and the latest on tropical storm Idalia as it heads into the Gulf in just a bit. All right, I don't know if you washed your car, maybe you did a rain dance, maybe you put off mowing the lawn for today, whatever you did. Thank you. And you got rain, <laughs> keep it up. Do it again. Yeah, we need it. And again. And again, and maybe it'll yeah. turn our luck. Today, some decent rain, especially on the far west side of town and into Medina County, Uvalde County, some good rain. Medina Lake Reservoir getting hit again. Unfortunately, it's not enough to really make much of a difference in the water level there, but we've got one lingering shower here right now along I-35, and this is around Lackland Air Force Base, Palo Alto, Alto College, I-35 and 410. That's pushing southward. I do anticipate this to make it to 1604 near Somerset, but there's not going to be as much left of it. Moving southward, Somerset, you could get it at uh, 7.05 p.m. is when that would make it your way. Let's take a look at some of the rainfall totals so far where we've seen some of the highest accumulations here, particular, particularly on the far west side of town near SeaWorld. This is 16.04, 151, and just south of SeaWorld, south of Military Drive between Military and Marbach. And look at these neighborhoods here, one inch estimated by the radar. Stevens High School, 0.8. This is good. That's some good, healthy 
soaking rainfall today that came in a few rounds, which is good because it wasn't all at once. When it all comes at once, then typically most of it runs off and doesn't really soak in as much. Let's go right to Medina Lake Reservoir here and over an inch estimated by the Doppler radar right over the reservoir 1.9 inches and 1.7 inches on the north end and even the watershed which stretches all the way up into central Bandera County very small watershed but it does stretch up into Bandera central Bandera County about one to two inches estimated by the Doppler radar in those locations now let's go off to the west where we still have some showers lingering lighter activity in Uvalde County but Valverde County seen a decent spread of rain Better than nothing, right? Better than what we've had lately. A decent spread of rain, especially just north of Lake Amistad Reservoir. This is all pushing to the south and southeast. Del Rio, you've got a shot at some of this building your way here over the next hour, but the clock is ticking because as we lose the daytime heating, we're going to start losing these showers even more. Here's a nice shot. What a beautiful sight. I don't like thunder, but it was great to hear it. <laughs> I agree. I agree with you on that. Don't like it, but it's great to hear it. Good to have it out there. Not as fortunate the rest of the week. No shot at rain tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. By the weekend, we're at a 10% chance. That's the latest update. We've got some uncertainty with that, but right now it doesn't look like a really good shot at much, if anything, in terms of rain this weekend. I think mostly closer to the Gulf Coast line, Saturday, Sunday, and then even Monday. We had a weak cold front push southward, so the wind shifted out of the north. You may have noticed that today. The door was open because the big blue H, the upper level high, centered over California. That puts us in this northerly flow aloft, the steering flow, which helped to nudge that weak cold front here and give us just enough lift to kickstart those showers that we have out there today. So welcome sight on the radar. This isn't always a very welcome sight. Of course, on the satellite picture, we've got Tropical Storm Idalia likely to turn into a hurricane pretty quickly this evening and tonight. Notice the latest Hurricane Hunter aircraft just made a sharp turn to go right through the center of that storm. And I think once the Hurricane Center gets the data back from this reconnaissance aircraft, they'll probably up it to a category one hurricane by the next update later on this evening. But it is forecast to become a major hurricane by the middle of the week on Wednesday. Right now, Hurricane Center has it at category three. I think there's a good chance this would become a category four before it makes it to that eastern coast of Florida, right in the big bend portion of Florida. None of that moisture is going to be headed our way or affecting us. Today was our 61st 100 degree day so far this year. We're going to keep adding to that. It's the all time record. And interestingly enough, Sarah Spivey put this together earlier today. So far, the month of August, the hottest month we've ever had on record with an average temperature of 91.1 degrees throughout this month. I mean, so often in the morning, we're about 80 degrees and in the afternoon, we're above 100 and much of the state upper 90s, low 100s today. Look at our trend here. 98 tomorrow, 100 by Wednesday, 102 by Thursday and Friday. So I do think we'll be just below 100 tomorrow. Just a result of this weak little cold front or not quite as hot front, maybe a better way to put it, but triple digits will be returning. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Adam. We'll be right back. The two San Antonio police officers shot last week during a manhunt near downtown and on the west side have now been released from the hospital. The officers were shot while trying to arrest Jesse Garcia Jr. on outstanding warrants last Thursday. Garcia was taken into custody after an hours long standoff at an apartment complex. The San Antonio police searching for the suspect who shot a 59 year old man. That shooting happened last night on East South Cross near Pecan Valley Elementary School. The victim expected to be OK. Officers say the suspect was wearing dark colored clothes. Today, the Bear County Sheriff's Office held its first straight to the streets class. The program allows people without a peace officer's license to take an accelerated program to get into the 40 week training academy if they make the cut. Sheriff Javier Salazar says he expects to open another class in the next few weeks. Water levels of Canyon Lake, the lowest point in history. According to water data for Texas, the lake is only 68 and a half percent full. The last lowest lake elevation recorded was in September of 2009. That's your 60 second recap.
Before we go, major traffic trouble spot to tell you about Highway 90 here at General McMullen completely shut down. Looks like an Amazon 18 wheeler across all lanes of traffic, a tow truck there on the scene. Yeah, it looks like it's jackknife. Don't know if any other vehicles are involved, but 90 shut down.